So um, I'll talk a bit about flexion instability here and surgical management. These are my disclosures, none of which are really pertinent to flexion instability. So I think we owe a debt of gratitude to the Mayo Clinic, as we do for many things, about teaching us a bit about this, and Matt Abdel for coming and giving us this stepwise approach. And this really taught me a lot and has helped me a bunch in this in this in this phase. And so I'd encourage you. There's about four articles I'll show here. I would download them, read them. They're very helpful in this space. But this really talks about this stepwise approach to revising for flexion and stability. There's there's a few things you need to look for: tibial slope, malalignment, posterior condylar offset, and then potentially the joint line. And is that distalized? And you can see in their series of revisions, almost all of them had increased posterior condylar offset, they increased the, uh, or they decreased the tibial slope, and then they raised the joint line a bit, all to help with, with flexion and stability. This paper out of the, the uh, Arkansas group is also quite helpful. It's a review article in JAOS, and it really just goes through this flow diagram, which really follows all the stuff that, that Matt's paper talked about. And in that, in that JOS article, they, they have some really nice diagrams to show you why these problems exist. But there's really basically two things on the femoral side that can be wrong, inadequate distal resection, an excessive posterior condylar resection, on the tibial side, ex excessive tibial slope. So those are things to be looking for. When you're diagnosing these patients, I think it's important to have them sit on the side of the bed and have their leg freely dangling over the edge. You can't do this with the patient seated in a chair and their foot on the floor. So you need to have their leg unloaded like this, and you do a few things. You can shuck the tibia superiorly and inferiorly and see if you can close down an open gap. You can have them fire their quad or stimulate the patellar reflex and see if you feel the gap close before the knee extends. And then you can shuck anterior to posteriorly. I think that's the most sort of subjective of the three to kind of feel for how much play that you have because obviously we all know that there are some knees that have a ton of play. Here are those exams in video form with a lady that I just examined last week. This is me doing the shuck superior inferiorly and closing down that gap. So I can feel it clunking closed, right? This is then me having her fire her knee, so fire her quad. And I'm just feeling for, it's hard to see in the video, but she actually closes the gap and then starts to extend. And then this is me feeling the A to P shuck to see how much you know motion do I feel there. And it's greater than a centimeter for sure. The other thing you can do, and I think this is helpful for any if you have a revision clinic and you're seeing patients for knee pain, I would encourage you to aspirate all these knees. Get ESR, CRP, and aspirate them all. It gives you good data about infection, but it also gives you good data about what else could be going on in the knee. And this is, again, out of the Mayo Clinic looking at aspirates in these patients and six and a half times more bloody serosinguous aspirations and flexion and stability. So it gives you a bit of a clue what's happening in the knee. Now, I would encourage you to also know that if you're going to be revising knees for flexion and stability, you need to know that their, their gains are only modest. These patients don't come back, you know, as heroes. They come back with some improvement, but it's, it's modest. And then if you treat them non-operatively, you can see that 66% of those treated non-op really had no improvement. So hard to treat them non-op, but, but warn them that they may not do as well when you treat them surgically. So here's a case example to walk through how we fix this. This 69-year-old female had a left knee eight years ago. She's never been satisfied with the knee. She's been having recurrent effusions and her knee gives way several times a day. She's otherwise healthy. We aspirated her, we got labs. Labs are normal, but on her aspirate, 3,000 red cells. So, you know, concerning for potential flexion and stability. We look at her radiographs and a few things pop up. On the femur side, you're looking for those two things, right? Decreased posterior condylar offset. And then she has this little bit of a step off or a slightly relatively distalized femoral component. And our tibia, she measures out at eight degrees of slope. So the combination of those two things obviously put her at risk. And so this is how I approach every knee revision. And I'm just going to sort of go through my algorithm, and then you'll see how it applies in this case. So the goals are to turn the revision into a, into a primary, and I, I gap balance. And so my revisions are gap balanced. And it starts with building a tibial base plate. And this really facilitates gap balancing, because every change that you make then affects both your flexion and your extension spaces. And in here, I'm gonna recut the tibia, then size the tibia, prep for a tibial cone, and then put in my trial, and then I have an implant. So here's how I do it. I actually cut with my primary extramedullary guide. So I use that every day when I'm doing primary knees, and I'm pretty good at using it because I do it a lot. And so then I just put it on for revisions the same way, and I just cut for a couple of millimeters. And in this lady, making sure that I'm gonna cut her at zero degrees of slope. And I just use a regular block and a drop rod to check my alignment because I do that again in every primary. I do it in my revisions, make sure my alignment's good. 
Then I just take and I take the tibial lollipop and I lay it up on top the tibia to size and position my tibial component. I take a marker and I mark the circle on the inside of that tray because that tells me where the center of my cone needs to go. Then I'll take, and you can see that marker mark, and I'll ream for the cone centered about that mark. So as Matt showed, I put the reamer in, let it kind of float, float the cone where I need to be so it's dead center under my tray, put the cone trial in, put the tibial trial in, and then I have a tibia to work with. And in this case, you can see that I changed the slope from eight degrees to zero degrees to help with her balance. On the distal femoral side, it's usually minimal bone resection that you're going for. And you should determine here if you need asymmetric augments based on bone loss and clean up your posterior condylar cuts. Now, I also will template my revisions to see what their difference in anatomic to mechanical axis alignment is and then cut specific to that. So this lady only measures four degrees when the revision components take off the stem at six degrees. So I just take the primary distal femoral cutter, set it at four degrees, pin it for a two millimeter resection, trim up the distal femur at four degrees, and then let the stem float because I'm going to put a short cemented stem in. And here I raised that joint line a couple of millimeters to help with that extension gap and kept her at four degrees. On the balancing side, once I've made those cuts, you balance the extension gap by doing relative ligamentous releases to get a rectangular gap in extension. Then I'll determine my extension gap using my balancer. So I have a revision balancer that I've kind of played with with Stryker. It's an old balancer, but then I could put augments on it. So I'll balance my extension gap. And you can see this gives me two pieces of information. Is it rectangular based on what angle is the difference between the femur and the tibia? And what size is my gap in terms of thickness? I'll do that in extension like this once I've done my ligamentous releases. In the flexion space, I'll put augments on the balancer to get the rotation right, and then tells me what my gap is. And then I'll adjust augments distally and posteriorly to give me a balanced gaps in extension flexion. On the femur side, once I have my gaps right, I'll then size the femur to allow for posterior augments as needed, trim up the chamfers by hand. I do most of this by hand and then cut for a box. And then I'll ream plus or minus for the cone and the stem and then trial. And you can see in this lady, the goal was to increase her off offset. We've increased it by eight millimeters. So overall, we took that revision. We raised the joint line two millimeters, took out the tibial slope, increased the posterior condylar offset, and balanced her knee, but on top of that, I threw in varus valgus constraint because I want to make sure that she's stable long term. And so even with a balanced knee, I'll put that in. Thanks.